first of all with, uh, with you, Chris, to ask, uh, after 40 years, are you amazed to be invited back to, to talk about the demons, having directed this such a long time ago? I am. <clears throat> I'm surprised that anybody, anybody trusts me to remember anything that happened there. <laughs> I'm 85 now, and uh, it, it is over nearly half my lifetime ago. Yes, okay. And uh, of all the Doctor Whos that you've directed, uh, is this one of the Doctor Who greats to your mind? It's my absolute favourite way, head and shoulders above any of the others I did. Yes. Well, what, why, is, why is that, do you think? The script was good, the subject I liked very much, and the cast were lovely. We had a very happy location here starting off. I mean, we had a bit of rehearsal in London first, but then we came up here and stayed in Marlborough for 10 days. And then when you have a snowstorm in the middle of your filming in May, well, <laughs> late April, it does sort of a, an interruption like that does somehow bring everybody together. Yes. How are we going to get over this? And I, I remember that moment very well. I remember dear Barry Letts, our producer, saying, oh, well, it's thawing. We'll just take, a, take an early lunch and hope it'll be better <laughs> afterwards. And that's what happened. Although, looking at it again recently, there were lots of places where the ground was very, very wet still from the thaw. Okay. Terence, where does this story come from then? So, two questions. What's the inspiration for this story? And who the heck is Guy Leopold? <laughs> well, um, I think really the, the answer to all those, both those questions is Barry Letts, okay. by and large. <laughs> um, and Barry was always interested in this kind of question, you know, the kind of questions that the show raised of spirituality, the supernatural, uh, self-sacrifice, you know, <laughs> The origins of man, you know, he was a great one for that kind of sub. Mm -hmm. And I think he always wanted to do a story on that kind of basis. And it, am I getting it mixed up? Is this the one with the audition piece that he yeah. did originally for... That's right, um, did for Katie and... and yeah, uh, that's uh, right, for Katie and the Captain Yates character, though, was it? Wasn't yes. Richard who played it, was it, in, in, in the oh. thing? But, but Barry wrote a little scene of, in which... Um, of some kind of magical event occurs with a Bible or something in a church. Throwing you know. it down onto the yeah, stone. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. It's an audition, uh, you know, and it was uh, to audition Katie, I think, <coughs> or to audition the companion. Yeah. And uh, he was, I remember talking to him about it one day, and he said, um, you know, just sort of casually, I, I always liked, you know, I was, I was very proud of that bit. I thought that was very good. Um, and... Um, you know, it's a shame that it should just sort of pass away as an un unheard, unthought of audition piece. So I said, well, why don't you do something with it? You know, I mean, you've got at least the foundation of a show there. And Barry and, uh, who was it, Bob Sleeve's friend, Bob Sloman, yes. went away and um, and came up with with this kind of basic idea, you know, of uh, witchcraft, demonology in an English village. Yeah. So did you have any involvement in the writing of it? Or the, or not, in, not in the writing of it. I edited it. Yes. Um, because, um, which was a bit tricky since Barry had largely written it or rewritten it, you see, because his... Um, I know it's kind of officially acknowledged now that, uh, that Barry wrote it, or fairly initially. I mean, I think Chris realised early on, didn't you, in, in the scripting stage. Mm. And... Um, but I had, uh, I had a good story, which is sort of partly true. It's always good if you've got good lie, you've got sort of partly true, which is Barry had asked his friend Guy Leopold to write it, which was true, that the script when it came in wasn't really up to standard, and Barry had more or less taken it over and rewritten it, you know, and um, that, is, uh, that is pretty much what happened, except that what ended up was really, I think, pretty well all that in Barry Letts, because you can kind of see his uh, fingerprints all over it, as it were. You know? so I don't think I was aware of that, Terence, actually, that Guy mm. Leopold was a real person. I just thought it was a Well, scene. he wasn't. No. Oh, OK, I see. <laughs> oh, I see. I thought you said you tried it. Oh, I see. No, he had a friend called Bob Sloman, who had written I'm stage plays. Yeah. I'm with you. But not for television, and... and um, Barry, who was always a, a sucker, um, you know, for being kind and kind-hearted and good and, 
other things like that, yeah. which never bothered me much. <laughs> um, he uh, wanted to help him and uh, and gave him and gave him the opportunity of doing the script, you see, which didn't work out, and Barry ended up pretty well doing. It. He was very happy with that, you know, because it was very much his his baby. And when it came to the novelisation, Barry Letts did that as well, didn't he? You didn't get a yeah, chance yeah. to do he, that. Yeah, yeah. It was a show that. Well, I I have, much no, show. I have no complaint about the number of novelisations mm. I've done. You know, I, yes. I could, <laughs> you didn't want that I one as well. I, I think I, I could spare one. Yeah. <laughs> and there, in fact, you see, to be honest, um, this show and and. Uh, was was a bit of a holiday for me because I knew it was in capable hands and that Barry would look after it. And all I did really on it was the final edit. Mm. Um, and all scripts, in the, in the writing stage, you cannot time a script precisely. You can't until you see what the director does with it. But um, certainly in the first stage, um, it was running too long, you know, I think even before we got to rehearsal. And so I did some trims on it, and the one I remember is that I was sitting in my office uh, going through, cutting the odd line here and there. It wasn't huge, it just needed, each script needed to lose a few minutes. And I saw one speech for the Brigadier and thought, that's a bit silly really, a bit frivolous, and um, put a pencil through it, you see. And Barry wandered in and looked over my shoulders and said very mildly, oh, do, you, do we have to cut that? I, I rather like that line. And I looked and said, which one? He said, oh, that one there, chat with wings, five round. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, all right, if you want it, I'll cut something else. <laughs> and uh, very nearly robbed the world of a thing. Was it always destined to be five episodes? I believe so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and was it? Five yes, it was. Yeah, it was. But yeah. it, it, so, so often, or certainly certainly on some of the Doctor Who's I've done, they seem overstretched and overlong. Six, it, six is tough, yeah. Mm. I mean, in the early days, when Barry and I first took over the show, we got stuck with a decision by Peter Byman and Derek Sherwin, our predecessors, um, to do seven parts. Oh. See, it's cheaper to do three seven parters yeah. than four six because what's the word? You amortise your 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 well, sets, your cars, yes. your actors, whatever. Yes. So you save money. But the thing is, you've got an impossible. You know, it's hard to do a good six part. It's hard which to is really down, what you're, yeah. Hard it's to just, do a good it, six, isn't it, Chris? Is what yes, you're so saying. Yeah. It, you'll find your fifth episode develops into a lot of chit chat. Yeah, yeah. Awful lot of dialogue and or, very little action. Or something, you yes, know. Yes, and so, it uh, can go right off the point. Yeah, yeah. So it's always a problem. I mean, four-parter is a much happier link for, mm -hmm. for who. But I think this made, this made a good five. This was a good yes. compromise. Yeah. I think it's, it's the only five. I mean, the fans and I think yes. it may be the only five we ever did. Is it? Oh, good. Well, what? The mind rubber. Ah. Black and white. <laughs> <laughs> Not in your time, Terence. No, 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 I don't care to remember. So you've kind of answered my question, Terence, which is my next question, which is, are you, are you happier with the next season that The Demons is in, that Series 8, than you were with Season 7? Yeah. I think I, we, all, we both got happier as time went on because Barry and I were getting more and more grip on the show and doing, turning it more and more into what we wanted, what we wanted it to be. And as I say, first of all, we got stuck with this uh, dreadful seven-part thing, and with the Doctor being exiled to Earth, which um, I always felt was wrong, you know, for, for, for Doctor Who as a, as a permanent thing. All right, mm -hmm. we got away with it for a little while. But who is the Doctor getting in his TARDIS, going off to another planet and saying, let's go out and have a look round? I mean, basically, you know and it's a lovely place and you'll enjoy it. You go that way, I'll go this way, and something jumps on somebody, you know, before very long. You know, that's your kind of basic who plot. And um, so we spent time gradually moving the Doctor and the TARDIS away from Earth and getting back to something like the original format. But um, meanwhile, we... Um, we did do, had to do Earth shows, and this, I think, was uh, it was a good example because um, when I told uh, Mac, my friend Mac Hulk about you know the, the, the exile to Earth, 
and he had a very kind of sharp computer like Bain and he said, thought for a bit, he said, well you've got two stories, he said, alien invasion or mad scientist. And um, the, that was true, you see, it, it, and uh, this story was uh, uh, in a way a successful getting away from that. It wasn't quite alien invasion <coughs> since he'd been there all the time. It wasn't quite mad scientist, although you've got the master, you know, so um, that was an attempt to bring the changes on, on a, a limitation, as it were. One thing I liked about it, but relating to Earth, was that it, it seemed in an ordinary situation, a typical English village, and it could happen anywhere in, mm. in, in the country, and it gave, I hoped it gave people a feeling that this could be happening just outside our Yeah, door. yeah. But you see, Chris, that's great in terms of one story. If you have to do it five times in the season, yeah. a certain monotony is going to keep it, yeah. you see. But as an exception, as a one-off, I think it works mm. enormously well. Chris, I was going to say, because we're here on the location, from a director's, I'm not, I'm not a television director, but from a director's point of view, is it, is it more fun, for a better word, to be on <coughs> location than within the confines of a studio? Much. Okay. I've, I've always preferred, I came from the film industry into television. I've always preferred film to television. The greater part of my career was done with multi-camera technique in the studios. The fact that nearly... All television today is done single camera, mm -hmm. or possibly a couple of cameras together, but um, very much feeling feeling of filming rather than and everything shots set up. Especially, I mean, every single image that is filmed from multi angle <coughs> is a compromise. You've got to have people in positions right for both cameras. You've got so to have a whole string of compromises. Yes, you one string. after the other. Absolutely, <laughs> right through. I mean. When I started television that long ago, it was live. And one was going like this up in the gallery the whole time. That's why there's nothing there anymore. <laughs> and then we came down to recording. And to start with, when we started tape recording, because tape was terribly expensive, we weren't allowed to edit it. Although, there it was. Well, we, if we, we had to get the producer's permission to edit. To, to stop and start again anywhere. So one kept going, and if the, if the producer at the end came in and said, okay, I think you went wrong there, something dreadful went wrong, you better really take that, that was him saying it, not the director. And thank goodness he did, but everything today is just so professional, looks so professional, it's quite a different scene. Um, Chris, from my mind, the barrow scenes, which aren't in the village, which are some considerable way up that hill, <coughs> was, just... was that a limitation, you know, to get all that equipment up to film well, those scenes? Well, and... um, it didn't limit things once we got there. I, I think we had some problems getting up the lane, as I remember, some of the, head, the, the generator that had to go up there for the lighting. But, I mean, one of the reasons we chose this location was because they were so close to the village. Okay. Um, and that the whole village itself um, was so perfect for what we wanted to do with the church and the green and, uh, and a nice little village with the pub on it and everything. Uh, and they were just up the hill. Memory Airfield wasn't far away, which is now, I think, junction something on the motor on M4. Um, and that was just a, a little way away. So everything fell into... In, into uh, our logistics, so to speak, because time being of the essence when filming, one didn't want to waste time driving from location to location. And, and this is my next question about logistics then. The villagers then, were, that, was that, were they encouraging to you, but were they somehow obstructive or an obstacle to the filming? Because it is such a small environment yeah, well, out there, isn't it? We never found them an obstacle. Everybody was very, as far as I knew, uh, Peter Grimway may have had problems with some of them. My, my production assistant, I don't know. But as far as I was concerned, everybody was very, very cooperative. People are very good. You know, you just put up a thing saying, sorry, you can't go to, you can't reach your house for two days, we're filming. <laughs> and say, oh, all right, then. <laughs> by and large. Yeah, did, by you come, large. did you visit locations, Terence? Yeah, um... But not often and not for long, because watching people film is incredibly boring. <laughs> Filming itself is exciting, excruciating and dramatic if you're the one that's doing it. 
But by the time you get out to filming, I mean, my job is done. It should be done, you know, the, which is to give the director a workable script. There'll still be a bit of tinkering and changes, whatever, according to circumstances <coughs> and place and bright ideas from the actors. But um, by and large, it sounds so I had no function. So you're just standing around watching. And I always say, it's like watching paint dry. It really, mm -hmm. you know, by the time they've tried to get somebody to walk through a door 17 times, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> so I, I, would all, I would go down, and I would go down with Barry and walk around saying, well done, chaps, great job. I always used to say it was like the First World War when the generals come down from the front, you know. And you go down to the trenches where the troops are there in the mud and blood and bullets and say, jolly good show, you're doing awfully well. And then you drive back to the chateau and have a good dinner, you know. So. <laughs>